a very good morning to each one of you and i am thankful to hrdc bharati darshan university uh, for this opportunity to speak to uh, the teachers uh, the professors from various colleges and universities in the country and i salute you all and congratulate you for uh, being part of this uh, refresher course in english where we are also discussing our own literature as dr laura has uh, aptly uh, reminded us we need to look into our own cultures and literary cultures in particular especially in times of cultural emergency and in times of uh, uh, of socio cultural upheavals and turbulences and policy changes in the country so though we are comfortably placed in the academia uh, the academia and uh, the higher education system in india is uh, going through an overall a kind of uh, unprecedented kind of change uh, is actually on in india especially in the context of the new education policy the national education policy 2020 uh, so we have uh, a kind of uh, uh monopolization and dominance of uh, a, a single language and uh, uh, the pushing of uh, uh, a monolith a monocultural model uh, uh, a monolinguistic model and also uh, a threat to the diversity and the differences and the 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 kind of linguistic uh, 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 plurality of india that uh, is imminent in the present so it is in this context that we are looking into the diversity of indian regional languages especially the life uh, languages that are spoken in south india our own context the difference of south india the cultural diversity and difference of south india and the long legacy of the changam tradition of south india so india has a difference from the uh the north indian context of uh, uh uh say hindutva or uh the broader uh, perspectives of sanskrit and hindi belt uh south india is having a different paradigm altogether a different socio cultural evolution and history and also a different linguistic paradigm altogether we, uh, in linguistic terms we are using the term dravidian to refer to uh uh damila or tamila uh or tamil in that respect so uh we have that uh, uh uh long lasting legacy of the damila or tamila in south india which has uh, uh, created a life and classical language from uh say perhaps now the studies are on so it's not uh, the last word but according to the current scientific studies uh at least 2000 years into the bc that means almost 4000 years so 3000 to 4000 years of continuous history writing history uh has also been revealed now so uh having a script uh and having a a, a literary continuous culture these are some of the ancient legacies of tamil uh which uh, makes uh, it a classical language not just a classical language according to the eighth schedule of the constitution but also a living language a life language and also it has created diasporas all over the world in south asia in various parts of the world even in europe and america you have the tamil and south indian diasporic people and uh, their thriving culture and uh, linguistic articulations and writing and expressions emerging from various corners of the world so this is the current reality and in this context uh, pushing with a, a kind of north indian language as the the only one and only kind of language or the one language formula or centralizing on that particular language the hindi hindu hindustani system or that greater hegemonic discourse uh, is uh, alarmingly 
uh, un egalitarian it is not democratic and also it's a threat to the diversity and plurality and uh, uh, secularism and regional federalism of this country which are the lasting values of the constitution the foundational values of uh, of of modernity and our constitution the diversity difference tolerance and coexistence and peaceful coexistence of uh, uh, of cultural difference so uh, in the world of multiculturalism in the new world of democracy we need to think about the regional diversities and the regional pluralities that are part of uh, uh, the the cultures the regional cultures of uh, our country and the world we are also the citizens of the world so therefore we need to respect the diversity and we need to conserve this plurality the great linguistic variety and the great literary traditions which uh, of course it may be the greater legacy of uh, south india the tamil legacy may be compared to the egyptian sumerian or uh, the chinese uh, that kind of ancient civilizations in the world because the new archaeological studies the new linguistic studies the new genome studies have uh, revealed that uh, uh, it is dating back to at least bce uh, 2000 and beyond the sites the archaeological and cultural sites of changam era like uh, kiradi uh, kiradi or kiladi in tamil nadu near madurai uh, the excavations are on the studies are on the dating has been done so uh, uh, the new discoveries the new findings the new reports uh, uh, and media analysis uh, show that uh, it dates back at least to uh, uh, bc 2000 and beyond and iron it was an iron based uh, uh, civilization which may be equated with uh, the indus valley civilization and perhaps they were enjoying greater cultural and uh, historic relations between the indus and the vaigai kind of civilization the vaigai and tamravarni and kaveri deltas of tamil tamilagam the greater uh, tamil country which uh, we need to understand we need to uh, imbibe the values and the uh, the cultural past and traditions so uh, let us come to this greater unit of south india or uh, as it existed from time immemorial uh, from this bc 2000 or bc 2500 uh, for the last uh, 4000 or 5000 years in history so uh, it's known as the tamilagam or the greater tamil country and uh, many linguists and other sociologists and uh, uh many historians they have traced that legacy um and they have linked it with uh, uh the indus valley civilization one of the ancient civilizations of the world so as i told you it is comparable to the indus valley the chinese the euphrates the sumerian and the egyptian that kind of great uh, ancient most ancient oldest uh, civilizational uh, uh sites in the in the whole world uh so this tamil country later uh, uh for perhaps in bc 6 between bc 6th and 3rd uh, century that is a, a time of change in in india because the indus valley has been existing from time immemorial and uh, it flourished during bc 3000 to bc 1700 or 600 that was the flourishing period uh, the heyday of the indus valley civilization and now these archaeological studies have revealed that uh, uh, the south india was also having a similar kind of civilization and perhaps uh, it was an extension or an outgrowth or when of course when there were other elements that uh, deteriorated or sabotaged uh, or uh, um, uh, or ended the indus valley civilization people of that uh, indus valley moved to eastern and southern part of this peninsula indian peninsula and they naturally they settled down in south india so uh, it's also seen as a parallel civilization to indus valley and also uh, um, a, a kind of extension and outgrowth or outreach of the 
the Indus Valley. So anyway, whatever be it is, uh, uh, further studies are on. Many epigraphical studies, many archaeological studies, many historical and anthropological studies and genome. Now, genome studies are also on. So uh, it's found that these things were related. So uh, the term Dravidian is, of course, a, a modern term. It's from Dravida. Uh, in Prakrit and also in Sanskrit, you have Dravida. So it is from that root it is taken from by the Indologists and the Orientalists uh, to talk about uh, the South Indian languages in particular. But also there are traces. Uh, it's it's predominantly a linguistic and cultural term. We are using it not as an ethnic or anthropological kind of term, but as a linguistic and cultural term. Uh, uh, Robert Cardwell, B Bishop Caldwell, uh, for example, uh, has elaborated on the Dravidian linguistics in, in Tamil, in, in the context of Tamil and South India. Uh, and from Bishop Caldwell uh, to B.R. Ambedkar, uh, to D.D. Kosambi and other historians and uh, other political and social uh, sociological kind of writers, they have uh, uh, analyzed and they have followed this uh, uh, Dravidian context and the relationship between Tamil and Dravidian kind of uh, culture. So uh, it's basically from Tamila or Damila that this Dravida, the Sanskritized version, Dravida is derived. Uh, uh, all the linguists are uh, of that opinion. And also uh, this Dramida or Dravida and uh, Damila, uh, these terms occur in various inscriptions, in stone inscriptions and edicts of various uh, kings and chieftains all over the peninsula. From uh, BC 3rd century to BC 6th century, we have such inscriptions. Uh, 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 Karavela, for example, even in Odisha, you have that uh, term, Dramida Sanghadam. Dramida Sanghadam means the Damila Sangha, or the, the, the egalitarian sect that is called the Sangha. Sangha means a united egalitarian body or uh, Gana that is called uh, the Sangha. It's a, a basic uh, notion uh, uh, that has uh, created something called the Sangham literature. Uh, the nomenclature of Sangham literature and Sangham culture is from the keyword Sangha. And Sangha is nothing but uh, the organized, egalitarian, democratic uh, group or the sect that is called the Sangha. It is a, a foundational uh, principle and idea of the Buddha. Buddha has this key uh, three principles, which are called uh, triple gems or the triple asylums. It is called... Uh, uh, the Buddha, the uh, Dharma, and the Sangha. They are called the three saranas, the three asylums, and also uh, uh, respected as the triple gem, the three jewels. Uh, uh, Buddha means uh, nothing but enlightenment. Uh, enlightenment through education and critical analysis and meditation. That is what Buddha in Pali. It's originally in Pali because the Buddha used... Uh, uh, the people's language, not uh, uh, the elite uh, uh, or priestocratic or pedantic language of scholarship, but uh, he was, uh, uh, though he was a prince, though he was aware of the elite register of language, the Sanskritized variety, but he was using the Prakritic variety or the natural and the uh, social life form of language, which was used by the common people because he was. Uh, trying to speak to the common people and women in particular. And women were also made into his followers and disciples, and they became the missionaries for the Buddha. And it is the nuns and the monks, they have propagated uh, his gospel to the people uh, speaking various practices in this peninsula. In, in India, South India and South Asia, they have even gone to South Asia, uh, Manimegali, for example. A bhikkhuni uh, or a Buddhist nun uh, who is the daughter of uh, uh, of uh, of Madhavi uh, in in Chalapadigaram and also in Manimekala, the sequel uh, which is part of the the Aimperun of Tamil Sangam 
literature. Uh, she goes to South Asia uh, as a great educator and a great missionary, and she speaks to the world. So they were speaking, Buddha and his disciples, they were trying to speak to the people. So that's why they have used the Prakrit, natural, normal, social life varieties of language, which were widely used by the people. So the Prakrits were the reality of India. And uh, Ambedkar has even gone to the extent of saying that uh, uh, Tamil is nothing but the Prakrit of South India. Uh, there are va various Prakrits. The northern Magadhi Prakrit is there. Buddha was mostly preaching there. So he used the Magadhi Prakrit or the Artha Magadhi, or it is also called Pali. Pali because it uh, uh, it protects the word of the Buddha. It is used to codify and uh, versify the gospel of the Buddha. Uh, and it is uh, uh, the protecting language of uh, the gospel of the Buddha. Therefore, it is called Pali, Pedi Pali uh, or Pali. Uh, and there, are, there were many other varieties. The Kalinga variety was there. Uh, the other Andhra variety was there. And uh, the South Indian, the Kini Pali, is mixed with the Damila or the Tamila variety of Prakrit, according to Ambedkar. He elaborates on this uh, linguistic identity of the Dravidian and the Naga people. He also equates between the Dravidian and Naga. And also, he says, Naga, if you talk in terms of culture and ethnicity, it is Naga people, uh, the common people of the subcontinent. And in linguistic terms, it is Dravidian or Damila or Tamila. So uh, uh, Damila or Tamila is nothing but the Prakrit of South India, argued B.R. Ambedkar in the introduction to who are the untouchables, who were the untouchables and how they became so. That is the uh, phenomenal work of Indian history and society that probed into the issues of untouchability, how untouchability came into existence uh, and how it was enforced and how it was uh, consolidated and how the Varna theory actually uh, cemented uh, on it and uh, uh, how this uh, unequal world, this graded inequality, the social hierarchy and social inequality of India was created. This is the, the, the foundational work, the foundational pivotal questions of Indian society and history were asked and answered in a very analytical and critical fashion by the architect of our constitution, Baba Sahib Ambedkar. And he, in Who Are the Untouchables, how they became so, explains about, in the introduction, he explains about the linguistic kind of uh, debate also. So according to him, Tamil is the practice of South India. And also in linguistic terms, in contemporary linguistics, it's also reasonable to argue like that because we know about the various varieties of Prakrit and the uh, Dachin or the, the Southern variety of Pali in particular. It is called the uh, Dakini Pali, Dakan, the word in English. We use Dakan, Dakan Chronicle and Dakan Herald and all. So the Dakan itself is from this Pali word Dakini. Dakini means the Southern, Tekken. Tekken, ten in Tamil we called about uh, ten, uh, ten Madurai and or means the southern Madurai. Uh, so uh, that kind of uh, greater legacies and linguistic kind of complexities and pluralities are there in association uh, with the uh, uh, with the uh, the long history of Tamil. So anyway, uh, since we mentioned about Ambedkar and his observation on language and Tamil as the Prakrit of South India. We also need to look into this origin of this caste system and uh, why people were made into un un untouchables and how they were made into untouchable. He also explains that because uh, as teachers, we need to look into this greater issue of untouchability and caste in India, which is uh, uh, killing people, the killing rage of caste. You have uh, uh, many so-called uh, honor killings, which are actually caste killings. Uh, 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 when people are uh, getting into an intermarriage, intercaste or interreligious ma marriage, it's an occasion of violence and, uh, and conflict in India. Even today, 
many such uh, so-called honor killings in the name of caste. It is happening. We know about Rohit Vimula and uh, many other uh, 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 brilliant students, brilliant uh, Dalit students who were uh, forced into this, humiliated into this uh, 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 shameful, untouchable kind of identity, reduced into their identity uh, of the caste and they were expelled and they were ostracized and they were somehow annihilated from the central universities and many other institutions of so-called excellence. But uh, they have become excellent caste centers rather than educational centers, unfortunately, in the country because of this uh, long lineage and this, uh, 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 this brutal genealogy of caste in India. So according to the architect of uh, our constitution, Ambedkar argues that uh, uh, it is a conflict between Buddhism and Brahmanism or the priestocratic patriarchy in India. But Brahmanism, uh, uh, he meant from uh, all these people, to Ambe from Ambedkar to Didi Kosambi, they have uh, the Marxist uh, historian Didi Kosambi. Uh, they have all explained and elaborated about this uh, uh, ideology and discourse of Brahmanism. Brahmanism is nothing but a, a priestocratic and a patriarchal religious dominant form. It is nothing but a Brahman or priest centered, the male priest centered ideology and hegemonic discourse. That's what. Brahmanism is all about. So uh, Brahmanism punished the people who were sticking on to after the defeat of Buddhism in India, after the cheat of Vishyamitra Sunga. We know about that. Ambedkar himself has elaborated about that, how the Mauryan, the great, the first uh, greatest empire of India uh, is the Mauryan Empire, dating back to uh, BC uh, 3rd century the time of uh, Ashoka, and also it began in BC 4th century, soon after the Buddha. Uh, Buddha was in BC 6th century, and he was the first uh, major philosopher and social practitioner, interventionist, and modernist in Indian history and the world history at large, uh, to question and challenge this priestocratic patriarchy uh, in the traditional culture. Because from, as we have seen, the uh, Indus Valley civilization, which was mostly uh, a bronze-based civilization, iron uh, became part of it later. New studies would uh, tell us more about that. The studies are just on. So anyway, uh, in the Indus Valley civilization, it's mostly a Dravidian. In linguistic terms, it's a Dravidian kind of uh, civilization, Asko Parpola and uh, our own Iravada Mahadevan and many other linguists and, uh, uh, and epigraphists, they have argued like that. It is mostly a uh, Dravidian kind of, because in linguistic and cultural affiliation, it's much close because many, uh, many writing uh, scripts, many strange petroglyphical kind of scripts that were found from Indus Valley, it is still undeciphered completely. Iravada and uh, Parpola, they were trying to unravel. They have uh, decoded certain uh, uh, ciphers, certain scripts and uh, symbols, but it's uh, largely undeciphered even today. Uh, so uh, according to these uh, scholars and, uh, uh, and researchers, uh, many scripts are common in the uh, ancient Indus Valley kind of uh, script, which they call the Indus Brahmi, the Indologist and the Orientalist, the Sindhologist, uh, Asko Parpola, uh, the Finland-based uh, scholar. Uh, he's also called uh, a, a Sindhologist because he's into Sindhu, uh, India and Indo. All these things are coming from uh, the word Indus or the Sindhu uh, 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 or the Hindu. It is also called the Hindu because the Persians and West Asian people, the Arabs and Persians, the Iranians, they couldn't pronounce it as Sindhu. And therefore, they pronounced it as Hindu. Sa was uh, pronounced as her. Uh, the consonant Sir was pronounced as her. And naturally, the Sindhu uh, River and the Sindhu Delta, the uh, Sindhu Wiley, they pronounced it as Hindu. That's why you have the Hindu River. You have the Hindu Kush mountain ranges uh, on the western 
part of this river you have the mountain ranges uh, with the khyber and uh, other passes to come to india so that mountain range uh, was also called hindu kush because of this uh, pronunciation difference of the west asian people the arabs in particular uh, so uh, uh, parpola is uh, a, a synthologist now he is called not just an indologist but also a synthologist whatever it is it's the same in english it is the sindhu uh, is called the indus and therefore uh, the term india so they have all revealed that uh, many uh, symbols and scripts are common in the old indus valley or the otherwise called indo uh, the indus brahmi brahmi itself uh, uh, is uh, divided into at least three by the epigraphies the ancient indus valley script which may be called the indus brahmi script b r a h m i brahmi script and uh, then the the ashogan brahmi they call it the ashogan brahmi that is b c 3rd century b c 6th century is the time of the buddha i mentioned b c 3rd century uh, is the time of emperor ashoka ashoka the great who was called the great by western uh, uh, thinkers and historiographers because he was uh, the creator of the first major empire in the whole world not just in india his empire is compared to the other roman empire or the alexander's empire and uh, many other such vast empires of the ancient world uh, our own romila thapar has uh, written about that ancient india ashoka and the decline of the mauryas uh so it began with his grandfather chandragupta maurya that is why it is called the mauryan empire chandragupta in bc 4th century he was uh, predominantly a jain he was believing in the jain uh, ascetic tradition the shramana tradition of india which uh, dates back to this indus valley civilization uh because we have that uh, uh, seal of the the uh, the man amidst uh, a meditating man a meditating human figure emitted the wild animals tiger and elephant and uh, and uh, 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 buffalo and the rhinoceros they are all around but emitted all those wilderness all those wild carnivorous animals a man is sitting and meditating with a headgear uh, with a kind of totem images and headgear special gear Uh, he is there it's called later it was uh, termed as pashupati but it is not exactly pashupati because it is dating back to bc 1500 uh, to 2000 that means 200 uh, sorry 2000 years before jesus uh, so that antiquities uh, and pashupata form of shaivism it originated only in ce in common era in ce 5th or 6th century pashupata shaivism originated in north india so it is not proper uh, it is uh, anachronistic to call that particular figure uh, pashupati or shiva uh, so it's anyway a form of the meditating uh, monk or the meditating human figure a meditating uh, perhaps a yogi uh, even the yoga the notion of yoga and yoga darshana and all those things came later uh, but anyway it's part of the shramanic meditating uh a uh, kind of uh, introspecting and meditating and and tranquilized form of uh, uh, a, 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 an ethical uh, practice may be identified in that uh, uh, figure in patmasana and he is also seated in a uh, in a posture which is uh, similar to the patmasana of uh, uh, of later iconography and also later in yoga it is called patmasana so uh, popularly it is known as the uh, the pashupati or uh, the patmasana yogi whatever it is it shows the uh, the 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 element of introspection the element of meditation the element of human contemplation and thought and uh, meditation emits the wilderness of nature uh, so from those images you have many similarities between the images that were found from the southern civilization especially from kiradi uh, and also many uh, characters and uh, many alphabets including uh, the the uh, say uh, the fish figure the fish motif meena uh, or fish motif 
is also a very common kind of character or symbol that you will find both in the in this valley uh, civilization and also in this uh, new discovered uh, Vaigai civilization uh, that is unearthed uh, in 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 Kiladi. No. So uh, uh, these uh, kind of uh, uh, interlinkages. Uh, these parallels show that uh, it's one of the ancient civilizations and uh, Tamilagam was part of the greater Indus Valley tradition, or at least it was uh, occurring parallel to that. And it, uh, they were having many uh, socio-cultural uh, trade inter, uh, uh, exchanges uh, over the, uh, 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 the, the expanse of history in, uh, in the peninsula. Uh, so from this context, uh, from these uh, uh, ancient uh, legacies, uh, you have the notion of uh, Sangham culture and Sangham tradition and Sangham writing and Sangham literature in, in, in Tamil. So in the Tamil country, uh, you talk about uh, three Sanghams uh, and uh, uh, these uh, greater Sanghams, they have created their greater epics and uh, writing and literature. And the Tamil form of Brahmi, the South Indian form of Brahmi, uh, which is now being unearthed from various parts of uh, Kiradi and uh, related sites, uh, which is also having remarkable proximity to the Indus script and also to Ashogan Brahmi, which is also called uh, the Dharma Lipi. Ashogan Brahmi is called Dharma Lipi because it is uh, it was used by Emperor Ashoka in particular uh, uh, to uh, propagate the word of the Buddha, the Dharma, the ethical principles of the Buddha, uh, the Buddha, Sangham, and Dharma, and also his four foundational uh, truths, which is called the Ariya uh, Such or the uh, the four noble truths that. Uh, there is great suffering and sorrow on this earth, and there is a cause for suffering. And this cause is nothing but uh, uh, human greed and uh, desire, excessive forms of desire. And uh, uh, it, it may be eliminated and uh, uh, controlling our greed and desires, our excess trishna and uh, kamana, that is the uh, self-control, practicing a self-regulation and self-check and introspective control of uh, your own uh, libidinal forces that can uh, that can uh, eliminate uh, the cause of suffering, uh, and that is the uh, there is a path for that. That is the eightfold path: uh, the proper thought and proper words and proper action and proper meditation and proper practice and uh, proper kind of uh, uh, executions and so on and so forth. So the Eightfold Path and also uh, five uh, principles or five precepts are to be followed in life. That is called the Pancha Shila. The Eightfold uh, Path is called the Ashtanga Marga or the Atta Magga in, in Pali. Pali is a simplified people's language, as I told you. So there you have, you find a, a very, uh, say, easy, and uh, uh, fluent and simple kind of pronunciation, Atta Magga. And Pali is close to Damila and uh, other people's languages of the country. Uh, so the other one, the five precepts, it is called the Panchashila, uh, which basically do not kill, do not steal, do not indulge in adultery, do not lie, and do not uh, use intoxicating drugs. Uh, to harm your mind and body. So this is uh, these are the simple five precepts of the Panchashila. Do not kill, that is the, do not harm, do not indulge in violence, in violence and cheat and in lies and in intoxication. That is the uh, foundational uh, ethical uh, kind of uh, principles or the uh, five precepts of the Panchashila. So these uh, have become, so uh, eight and five and three, these are the, uh, in numerical terms, these are the magical figures in the teachings of the Buddha. And these things have become part of the, uh, the Sangham tradition also. Sangham itself is from the triple jump, 
uh, the uh, uh, the third important uh, uh, gem or asylum or sharanam uh, that is buddham dharmam and sangham so from sangham you have sangham literary academies the ancient tamil literary academies at least three were uh, and they have codified many but unfortunately these things were lost in the later uh, say sanskritization or alienization whatever it is called in the later post 8th century after the bhakti cult has developed after the brahmanical invasion has happened through uh, the shaiva and the vaishnava kind of bhakti frenzy and movement all these buddhist principles and uh, uh, writings and the most of the uh, literary texts were lost because they were having this ancient uh, polyphonic secular predominantly dravidian and shravana kind of culture the sangam literature is uh, built on the foundations of ancient jain buddhist and ajivaga azivagam in tamil we are calling it azivagam so that azivaga a materialist kind of uh, uh, legacy the azivagam and uh, jain and buddhist legacy they were all looking into the uh, a cosmology where there is no theocentric kind of world they were into only the ethical principles of this world and in buddhism and jainism you have a complete rejection of the god center and the spirit and they talk about uh, 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 ethics or the dharma as the principle of uh, of religion or of this world and in materialist philosophies like charvaka and ajivaka they believe only in the practical things they don't indulge in anything related to the uh, non material and the so called spiritual uh, so these were uh, together known as the shramana traditions in tamil it is called uh, amana shramana in sanskrit in tamil and it is called and also in pali it is called amana so pali and uh, uh, tamil they are mostly related very close to each other and that's why the the uh, the the, the dharma lipi the dharma lipi which is uh, which was predominant in the pali and uh, magadh region which uh, when it reached south india it's also uh, created something called vattalutu vattalutu or vattalutu uh, vattalutu uh, is uh, 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 kind of modified more regionalized form of the dharma lipi or uh, ashogan brahmi and tamil script even today retains many characteristics of this brahmi and vatrutu kind of traditions later many infiltrations the pallava grantha script and many other kinds of additions were done uh, into it but even today tamil retains the original uh, say the the minimalism in the number of alphabets and also uh, in the shapes and writing kind of style it retains many aspects of the ancient ashogan brahmi or the dharma script and later evolution of uh, vatrutu can also be seen uh, other traces of vatrutu is still retained by the tamil modern script uh, uh, so uh, these are some of the uh, the uh, overarching legacies of south india so south india was a unit and only later uh, you have uh, 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 uh in only in modern times you have the differentiation into uh telugu and uh, kannada and uh, the current tamil uh in further south and malayalam towards the western part of the western ghats earlier it was all palam tamil and various of course various regional articulations and registers and dialects and various forms of languages were there but uh, it was predominantly tamil even in kerala uh, till the 16th and the 17th century tamil was the spoken language and the language of literature and also the common language even in 14th and 15th century in some uh, patu and chambu kind of traditions writing traditions janas uh, tamil was uh, invariably used only the uh, different dialect called uh, the malayam variety of tamil malayam tamil was used in in kerala uh, ramagatha patu and many other patu and chambu and sadeshagavya things uh, only in 16th century large scale sanskritization was practiced in in kerala 
and um, uh, till the 16th century till eduthachan it was predominantly tamil even in 16th century when the portuguese came to kerala and when they have initiated a, a peculiar art form called the chavittu nadagam which is a, a form of theater with a lot of uh, kicking and uh, stamping on the floor that is called chavittu nadagam chavittu stamping on the floor uh, forcefully to create a sound uh, a visual uh, and uh, 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 and uh, and audio kind of spectacle and effect that's called chavittu nadagam mostly it was on uh the tales of uh, uh jesus and christianity a christian art form in kerala even in chavittu nadagam which was uh, set by the portuguese in 16th century tamil uh, songs are used even the the finale the mangalam the mangalam part is also set in the tamil kind of idiom tamil bhagavathas tamil musicians were used to uh render that also the chavittu nadagam uh compositions and songs so uh, that shows uh till 16th century or 17th century tamil was the common language of the people and even in literary and cultural productions tamil songs were used uh so uh, it's the same with karnataka also but um, uh, proximity to north india and sanskrit and hindi kind of traditions and influences uh, have further sanskritized telugu and kannada and also it deviated uh, away from the proto dravidian the ancient uh, proto dravidian the old or the ancient form of tamil but uh, we have in sangam literature in padatripath or aganaanur or puranaanur uh, paribadal and all those uh, texts that were recovered later only in modern times these things were somehow recovered in the context of imperialism so the colonial modern paradigm the importance of the colonial paradigm the british rule in india is also very important in the recovery of this legacy uh of this dravidian and also this tamil ancient legacy and uh, even the tirukural was uh, almost lost only a few kurals were there uh with uh, some uh, private collections but uh, only in 19th century that's what we are on only in 19th century it was completely recovered and pandit uh, ayodhi das's uh, own grandfather kandapan uh, who was a butler of the britishers because of his relationship with uh, the british and somehow he managed to recover those he chanced upon certain manuscripts and those manuscripts many of those manuscripts ancient pali and tamil manuscripts they were also uh, aware of uh, of pali that's a uh, another amazing uh, kind of reality a vital fact that uh, we need to remember pandit ayodhi dasar and his father and grandfather they were able to recognize pali also and uh, ayodhi dasar panditar he became a pandit in pali also he was a multilingual scholar so that's what uh, uh, i am coming to we need to come to pandit ayodhi dasar and later to in the second part of the uh, discussion and talk we will also try to reach narayana guru in kerala and see how the tamil legacy has influenced him so that's uh, our theme but uh, we need also need to talk about the dravidian and the tamil legacy the greater changam legacy and the relationship in the swali uh, so that we may get this global vision of the tamila this uh, uh, larger greater india uh, this greater india that was part of the greater world and how it has uh, its relationship with the indus valley civilization and the great mauryan empire and the mauryan buddhist civilization and all uh, so that's why i am talking about the the background and the script and the epigraphy and archaeology and uh, things like that uh, so now let us uh, come to pandit uh, ayodhi thasar or ayodhi thasa panditar he has so many names like the names of the buddha 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 I, uh, I, uh, according to the amaragosha is uh, having at least 18 synonyms the formal names 18 so likewise uh, narayana guru is also having uh, so many names nanu guru danu ashan and uh, narayana guru sri narayana guru brahmarshi sri narayana guru and so on and so forth likewise Uh, pandit ayodhi dasar or uh, panditar ayodhi dasar avargal uh, is also called uh, panditar avargal pandit ayodhi dasar avargal or yodhi das or yodhi dos 
Ayodhi Dasa. Ayodhya is also called Ayodhya Dasa because Ayutthaya was the, the ancient Buddhist name of Ayodhya. It's not from the Ramjanma Bhumi kind of thing, but it is from the ancient Ayutthaya kingdom, which was a Buddhist uh, kind of name. So from there you have Ayodhya Dasa and uh, Ayodhi Dasa, Yoti Das, Yoti Dos, Dasar, so many. Uh, more than 18, you may find it. it uh, the spelling in English also invariably so many uh, interchangeable uh, spelling combinations are also used. So whatever it is, that shows the popularity, the kind of legendary kind of uh, uh, status uh, uh, that was enjoyed by the Panditar in 19th century. So he was uh, from 19th century and uh, uh, he was born in uh, 1845 uh, in Chennai, Thousand Lights a suburb in Chennai, 1845, uh, May 20th, uh, sorry, uh, yes, May 20th, uh, his birthday is coming. Uh, today it is 13th, uh, so we are moving towards his uh, birthday. Uh, uh, all of you. Uh, the birthday wishes of uh, Ayodhya Tasa Pandita to all of you and his demise was also in May. Uh, May 5th uh, is actually his uh, uh, Remembrance Day. Uh, he passed away on May 5th, uh, 1914. In 20, early 20th century, 1914 he passed away. So he was born in 1845 and at the age of 69 or 70, he passed away in 1914. Uh, so he's basically from Chennai basically from the uh, the chola country uh, and uh, uh, but he made his uh, 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 manifestations and his social interventions both in chennai and also he was centering uh, in nilgiris because uh, from his grandfather's own time they moved to uti and uh, he was the butler of uh, mr harrington a britisher and uh, 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 a wealthy, uh, prosperous kind of influential Britisher, Mr. Harrington, George Harrington. And uh, he was the butler and also the physician. They were traditional medical practitioners. That's one thing that we need to remember. But Andi Jayoti Dasa and his family, they were from the Dalit community. They were considered as untouchables, but they were medical practitioners who can even talk to the British in English language. And they knew Pali and then Tamil and Sanskrit also. So at least uh, four languages he knew. That is the peculiarity of Pandit Ayodhya Thasa. He was a multilingual scholar and real Pandit in 19th century. Uh, remember, this happened during the heyday of colonialism. And uh, of course, the colonial modern paradigm has provided many breaks, as in the case of uh, B.R. Ambedkar. He also uh, emerged from a family of so-called untouchables, from the Mahar community he came. But they were uh, uh, civil servants and uh, military uh, kind of officers in the Royal British Army for at least three generations. So three generations successively, they have learned English language. And that's how Ambedkar emerged and he created the constitution and the book of law for India. Uh, he became the first justice and law minister of India. And he resigned it for the Hindu court bill or the liberty of women, the property rights of women. Uh, uh, for gender justice, he uh, relinquished his uh, ministership from the uh, Nehru's cabinet. Uh, so uh, the point is that he, uh, Pandit Ayodhya Tasa, he was a multilingual scholar. He knew Tamil, he knew Pali. That is amazing. That that shows, and he argued that the untouchables, the Dalits of Tamilagam, the Parayas in particular, they are not actually Hindus. He declared it in 1886 itself. He declared that uh, the untouchables, the Dalits of Tamilagam, they are not Hindus. They are not part of the Varnashrama Dharma of Hinduism. They are not part of the Chadurvarnya because they are outside. They are Avarna or they are the, the, the fifth uh, category. They are called the Panchama, the Panchama or Avarna, Panchamar Mahajana Sabha. He created that in 1870s itself. He created something, an organization called Panchamar Mahajana Sabha. And also Dravida Mahajana Sabha. And later, in the late 1880s, he created something called uh, the Dravida Mahajana Sabha. And also 
uh, in between he uh, before that he created the dwaidananda sabha also but advaita was actually originally from the advaya vada the samudaya vada the anitya vada of the buddha but unfortunately in india many infiltrations and uh, deviations have uh, uh, actually taken hijacked the theory of advaya vada the non dualism or the uh, the spirit of uh, uh, fraternity the the universal fraternal paradigm or maitri that was hijacked and later in 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 uh, ce uh, second century nagarjuna created it into mystified this anitya uh, or samudaya of uh, buddha into something called shunyavada the shunya the keyword was uh, uh, created by nagarjuna a brahmanic uh, uh, pandit who was into buddhism and actually uh, uh, initiated the, the development of mahayana buddhism a liberal and uh, almost brahmanical kind of buddhism and uh, later gaudhabada the proper vedic and vedantic scholar gaudhabada uh, linked this shunya with the brahma and atma vada of vedanta hindu brahmanical vedic vedantic thought and uh, in c 9th century 8th and 9th century shankara Uh, who is said to be the prachanna buddha he appropriated uh, it further into his theory of advaita so the advaita vada or the samudaya vada of the buddha was uh, uh, through many hegemonic kind of uh, interpolations and uh, transformations and appropriations it was somehow abrogated and appropriated and assimilated into the vedic metaphysics of brahmanism in india through nagarjuna Uh, he knowingly or unknowingly mystified it and uh, further complicated it into something called shunya anitya was made into shunya then into atma and brahmavada by gaudhapada and then into advaita philosophy by shankara himself so that's why other traditional uh, scholars and uh, madhava or uh, ramanuja and other more conventional kind of brahmanical scholars and thinkers they call shankara prachanna buddha a buddha in disguise because he has actually assimilated uh, the theory of the advaya vada of the buddha uh, into his advaita uh, so anyway this kind of changes have also happened uh, so advaita is mostly appropriated in later india at least from early middle ages onwards advaita was appropriated into the brahmanical scholarship and hermeneutics by many brahmanical philosophers uh, Uh, like gautabata uh, in uh, 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 and also by shankara so therefore uh, though ayodhya tasar he, uh, uh, he he initiated advaita ananda sabha he uh, soon realized with his sharp critical edge he realized that uh, it's not going to reach anywhere and uh, uh, declaration especially it was the time of colonial modern and the census was on and when the britishers initiated the procedures for census in 1870s he was thinking about that what to stand whether with the hindus or not uh, so he, uh, uh, he he chose doubt and he moved away from hinduism and in 1886 1888 is the uh, the year in which narayana guru he established his first consecration breaking all the hindu customs and tradition and brahmanical dictates he consecrated his own deity and he called it an ijava uh, kind of deity uh, uh, so likewise in 1886 uh, uh, age wise uh, uh, ayodhya dasa pandita is the elder uh, he was born in 18 uh, uh, sorry 1845 and narayana guru some 11 years later in 1856 narayana guru was born and panditar passed away in 1914 and uh, guru passed away in 1928 so uh, pandit ayodhya tasar is the first person historically speaking chronologically and also he is the elder in social revolution and also social change in south india uh, so uh, tasar in 1886 he declared that we are not hindus we are outside the hindu fold we are the original buddhist that was his claim we are the original buddhist and he was one of the first scholar and social leader and social revolutionary to uh, declare that uh, uh, the dalits are uh, the traditional buddhists 
the dalits are the original buddhists of south india the parayas in particular the parayas and pallas and many other sub castes the chakliyas and many many other sub groups of the dalits we are the the enlightened people we are the working people we are the intellectual people we are the cultural force of this land and we are heir to the ancient legacy of buddhism and the ashogan missionaries and the writing script and uh, the, uh, the the scholarship and culture and civilization in south india so we are heir to the sangham legacy we are children of this uh, uh, chilapadigaram and manimekhalai and kundalagesi jivaga jindamani valayapatti and all these 18 mel kanak and 18 keel kanak of the uh, the sangham literature we are the uh, the inheritors of that we have created that greater changam legacy the kiradi or the madurai and uh, the vaigai civilization at large so it is uh, pandita who actually enlightened the whole world because he was able to speak in english and write in english as well because uh, as i told you they were very close to the britishers they were the uh, the personal physicians the siddha practitioners they were not just uh, into language and scholarship and writing and teaching but they were also in the medical practice they were the medical practitioners and the physicians the siddha uh, physicians of uh, uh, even the 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 white sahibs so um, uh, he then he started his uh, uh, journalism his great uh, defiant social form of journalism and he started his journals tamilan was uh, instituted in uh, he got uh, many support from the colonial uh, and uh, missionary kind of people uh, kernel all court for example theosophical society and kernel all court and uh, 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 and john uh, reverend john rathinam reverend rathinam provided him uh, many opportunities of the new found press and he was into printing and press and journalism and he initiated this tamilan journal tamilan or tamilan journal oru paisa tamilan it was sold for one paise and that's uh, why it's called oru paisa tamilan so he initiated his journalism and uh, uh, he was uh, furiously attacking the caste hindu uh, kind of dogmas he was attacking the caste system the origin in the varnashrama or the varna theory and also the critique of the veda and vedanta and the uh, so called uh, classical metaphysics the smriti shruti puranas were consistently critiqued and exposed uh, in a radical and rational way by pandit ayodhya tasar through his writing in a journal called dravida pandian so dravida mahajasa dravida pandian and or uh, isaram and then he also wrote something called a historical treatise imaginative uh, social history of tamilagam he has written the social history the buddhist social history of south india he has written that is called indirar desa charitram indirar desa charitram means the 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 buddhist history of south india in modern terms indirar desa charitram means the desa charitram of indirar indirar is none other than the buddha the enlightened one the conquered one the tirthankaras and the buddha they are called the van, uh, the, the conquerors because they have conquered themselves the desires the human lust and the greed and desires they have conquered their own mind and body that's why uh, the tirthankaras they appear naked they don't they don't uh, believe in any kind of bondage they are beyond the bondage and beyond the body and even beyond the uh, uh, cravings of the mind so that's why they are called the jinas those who have conquered everything the the conquerors so in that sense indira means uh, the buddha and also the tirthankaras naturally the shramanic tradition the buddha in particular so indira desa charitram means the buddha's history of south india or the buddhist history of tamilagam so uh, he has uh, created that and uh, uh, he also asked his followers many followers and many uh, in 1890s he went to early 1890s he uh, uh try to officially leave this dominant religion of hinduism and they were basically they were vaishnavite hinduism they were believing in vaishnavite hinduism uh, but uh, uh, he wanted to uh, abandon and leave from that particular 
religion and he want to embrace their original religion or the ancient religion the ancient cultural philosophy uh, of buddhism and that's why he went to with the help of kernel alcott and uh, robert john ratnam and also anagariga dhamapala anagariga dhamapala the great uh, buddhist missionary from ceylon he was influenced and he became a close friend and associate of pandita ayodhidasar and uh, ratnamalai srinivasan he was also another great uh, revolutionary dalit leader of tamilagam they were also having very close uh, association so ratnamalai srinivasan anagariga dhamapala from ceylon uh, kernel alcott from the west and uh, also reverend john ratnam from tamilagam they have combined and they they uh, they actually cooperated on many frontiers in knowledge and also in social liberation uh, and uh, uh, ayodhya sir he went to uh, ceylon and he accepted diksha that means official uh, kind of uh, religion uh, into the uh, order of the sangha he entered the uh, order of the sangha uh, he accepted diksha from a theravada bhikkhu called uh, sumangala nayake or sumangala thero sumangala thero has initiated him into buddhism so he accepted diksha by going to ceylon and uh, uh, in the 1890s and uh, later naraguru also went to uh, ceylon he uh, went to ceylon twice in 1916 and 1926 before just two uh, years before his demise the guru has also visited uh, uh, sri lanka and he made this uh, comment that uh, mine is also ours is also buddhism and he was quoting amarakosha uh, the basic lexicon in 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 language uh, in south india that was used in traditional education in kerala also amarakosha he quoted and he said dwayavadi vinayaka i am in the path of that dwayavadi vinayaka who is the buddha these are part of the dashabalu shatabhijnu dwayavadi vinayaka this is written in the Uh, uh given in the amarakosha by amarasim has the part of the 18 synonyms of the buddha so guru was quoting amarakosha in ceylon and proclaiming that he was also a buddhist but he never formally converted into buddhism but he was into a kind of polyphonic uh, uh syncretism of all religions and uh, the virtues of uh, all religions but uh pandita ayodhita sar avargal he went in person to ceylon which has which has remained as a buddhist country from the time of ashoka remember it was ashogan missionaries Ajo, ashoka's own daughter bc 3rd century ashoka's very daughter sanghamitta who actually took a, a, a sapling from gaya the bodhi sapling that uh, fig tree and a sapling was taken by uh, sanghamitta and she kept it close to her heart and she went on a ship from kalinga from odishan port from kalinga to ceylon uh, ceylon to anuradhapura and he planted it there and he nurtured anuradhapura into a, a greater city of enlightenment and that's how that country ceylon was proselytized by uh, sanghamitta uh, so um, uh, ayodhya sir went there in person and he converted officially uh, to buddhism by taking the diksha from uh uh tero uh sumangala uh nayaka uh, and he came back and in late 1890s towards the end of the 19th century he also established something called the shakya buddhist society uh, in nilgiris and also its many branches were there in many parts of tamilagam and also in south asia in singapore in padang in malaysia in many parts wherever the tamil diaspora were there wherever the tamil dalit people were working outside in even in south africa many such uh, diasporic uh, people were there from the tamil uh, kind of background so uh, they established many uh, uh, branches also in various parts of tamilagam and outside they have established this uh, shakya buddhist society uh, towards the end of the 18 90s towards the end of the 19th century and this is also known as the indian buddhist association in english it is called indian buddhist association later you have anagariga dhamapala himself establishing something called the mahabodhi society of india so even before that uh, it was uh, uh, pandita yodhita sir his close ally and friend uh, 
uh, who uh, actually pioneered this in uh, in India. This happened in the uh, uh, for the first time in the whole of India. In modern times, it is uh, even before Ambedkar, it happened. Ambedkar's Navayana was in the 1950s. He converted along with uh, five lakh followers at Nagpur in 1956. Just uh, imagine, almost 60, six uh, decades ago, Pandit Ayodhya Dasar has created, officially he converted, and also he created this Shakya Buddhist society. So, South India has shown the model to, uh, to the whole of India. Ambedkar ha has become a kind of uh, uh, follower in that respect. Ambedkar is the third one. In between, in Kerala also, there was one Neo Buddhist movement. So, Pandit Ayoti Tassar is the pioneer of the Neo Buddhist movement and the Neo Buddhist Dalit movement in, in the whole of India. And in uh, soon after Ayoti Tassar, there was uh, uh, <clears throat> this uh, Neo Buddhist uh, cultural movement which was uh, rendered or unleashed by the students of Narayana Guru, uh, Sahodar Nayapan and uh, Mithavadi Krishnan and Sivi Kunjaraman and Mulu. The lead disciples, mostly writers and cultural activists, they were also into political representation and into legislative assemblies. So they have initiated the second uh, Buddhist uh, cultural movement in India. It was not exactly religious, but it was, uh, uh, according to the polyphonic secular principles of the Guru, it was not exactly religious, but uh, largely a cultural, socio-cultural transformative movement that was the second movement was in Kerala. The first movement was in Tamilagam, initiated by Pandit Ayutthas in the 90s itself. Only in 1910s and 1920s, some 20 years back, it was, uh, 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 it was followed in Kerala uh, by the students of the Guru, Sahodarana Yepan and uh, Mithavadi in particular. And the third movement you have in Baba Sahib Ambedkar, in the 1950s, Ambedkar in 1935 itself, he declared in the Yola conference, he declared that I was uh, born a Hindu. It's not my fault, but I will not die one, he declared. And he fulfilled that promise in 1956 in Nagpur, right under the nose of uh, the RSS headquarters. He converted along with almost five lakh followers uh, on that Ashoka Vijayadashmi. It took Ashoka Vijayadashmi, the conversion day of uh, uh, Mauryan Emperor Ashoka into Buddhism. That's called Ashoka Vijayadashmi. Unfortunately, it's made into a kind of Hindu kind of festival and a, uh, a weapon worshipping kind of uh, uh, feat now. But it was actually the abandoning of all weapons by Ashoka, especially after the, the war of Kalinga. He abandoned his sword and he never took uh, those weapons of mass destruction and he took the the word of the dharma he became a dharma vijayi abandoning his weapons that is ashoka vijaya dashmi his dharma vijaya is marked he abandoned his sword and he took dharma the ethical principles of the buddha as his uh, uh, instruction or word or gospel and that is the dharma vijaya the ashoka vijaya dashmi that was uh, that was selected by Baba Sahib for his conversion, and uh, that is the third and the most successful one. Uh, if you, uh, of course, Pantidhar uh, succeeded uh, because he was able to create uh, followers and uh, many other institutions. Even today, the followers are there in Tamilaga, you know. But uh, in the case of Kerala, uh, it never produced a religious kind of upsurge because it was a cultural thing. Uh, and uh, in the case of Ambedkar, it was the most successful one. Because in the history, the whole history of India, single-handedly, Ambedkar actually revived that thing in Western India. And uh, uh, lakhs and lakhs, five lakhs uh, in Nagpur, another one lakh in Chandrapur, and in many, on, on, on all these, uh, uh, on, all, uh, uh, on, a, on a, an yearly basis, every year, we have uh, the followers of Neo Buddhism on the rise in India. Even today, uh, in the Diksha Bhumi, on Ambedkar Jayanti, or on his Remembrance Day, or on Ashoka Vijayadashmi, we have uh, thousands and thousands of people coming and embracing uh, the Buddhism, the Navayana Buddhism of Ambedkar that was uh, refashioned and re uh, say uh, defined by Ambedkar in more egalitarian and uh, 
more ethical way in uh, in uh, 1950s so these are the three movements and uh, the pioneer is of course uh, uh, ayodhi tasa panditar uh, so panditar uh, um, is uh, a great social reformer a great uh, social revolutionary and he is also a great scholar of tamil and pali and english and sanskrit that's why he was able to unravel the uh, the past of tamilagam and he was able to connect with the greater changam tradition and the ancient civilization the changam culture and civilization of the tamil country the greater tamilagam and south india was a unit and uh, the chera chola pandya pallava these were the regions kerala was only the chera land chelapadigaram the aim per part of the aim perungapiyam the five fold greater epics of tamil silapadigaram was written in kerala in today's kerala then it was the chera land uh, the cheran shenguttuvan cheran shenguttuvan was ruling from this mujiri recently uh, 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 the chief minister stalin made a remark in the uh, in the assembly that uh, this mujiri or mujiri pattanam mujiri pattanam is uh, in the in, in our heart he made that statement and also he is for more excavations and more studies archaeological historical studies all over south india he is taking south india as a unit in kerala he want to study in patanam uh, the dhamalipi was revealed patanam which is part of the mujiri patanam or musiris which is called the ancient musiris which is called vanji in tamil literature in changam literature it is called vanji vanji was a great ancient buddhist uh, Uh, uh university also there were many regional branches of vanji all over uh, south indian peninsula so vanji or muchiri uh, that was in in kerala and ilango adigal was the younger brother of seran sengutuvan and he composed his selapadigaram here in the muchiri patanam or vanji nagaram and uh, he was here ilango was here and uh, the, you have the even in manimekale you have the uh, cross crossing of the uh, uh, south indian peninsula uh, madhavi and uh, manimekale and kannagi they are uh, uh, coming from pumbuhar to vanchi uh, to other ports to various other uh, kanchi vanchi and uh, pumbuhar puhar all these greater ports of south india are uh, are described in the various episodes and cantos of uh, the ancient sangam literature specifically in chilapadigaram and uh, manimekali in particular if chilapadigaram is seen as a jain largely a jain epic uh, written by uh, ilango adigal who was also a jain sage uh, manimekali the sequel to it written by his close friend and associate chitalai chatanar uh, that is seen as a proper buddhist epic buddhist philosophy is being elaborated through women women characters madhavi and manimekali manimekali in particular she becomes a, a buddhist nun and uh, she preaches the gospel of the buddha the ethics of the buddha the dharma to the world and becomes a, a, a globe trotting greater missionary uh, so these kind of legacies pandit ayodhi tasar was able to connect to and revive to and the context of british imperialism very crucial colonial modern paradigm is very much crucial in the rise and recovery of all these manuscripts and uh, uh, printing and publication are very important the, the print public sphere opened up by british imperialism is uh, uh, has been very crucial and it's also acknowledged later the guru in 1914 he made a statement in kerala that he never studied english language he never knew it but he was equally a scholar in both english uh, sorry sanskrit and tamil apart from malayalam he was able to speak and write in tamil and also in sanskrit he composed poetry in tamil uh, we will perhaps in the second part we may come to that uh, so the guru in 1914 i may conclude with the statement of the guru here uh, that in 1914 he made it clear that it is the british uh, who uh, uh, who gave us uh, a right to uh, uh, sagehood and education uh, because if it was in the uh, hindu raj or ram raj i would had uh, been beheaded by the lord himself as he did it to shambuga shambuga was brutally beheaded by the lord himself 
by saying that he is a so called shudra according to the varna theory of uh, brahmanism uh, the chaturvarnya theory he was a shudra so he tried to learn the art of the alphabets and he taught the other shudra kids and uh, that's why he was killed so uh, uh, in in the time of rama the shudradis were not allowed uh, for uh, education and the right of sanyasam that was uh, uh, the statement by a guru so it is the british who are our guru oh, he was trying to embrace the greater modernity of the west and the enlightenment tradition of the west that uh, uh, he uh, uh, found then in those contexts of 19th century early 20th century as very emancipatory and also pandit ayoti dasar he was also critiquing the national movement the national movement which was uh, uh, trying to become or which was actually a brahmanical uh, kind of nationalism like uh, mahatma phule he rejected that so in the statement of the guru also a critique of this brahmanical nationalism the jingoism that has become the totalitarian reality of india today through its cultural nationalism uh, was critiqued by pandit ayodhi dasar uh, narayana guru in kerala and also mahatma phule in western india so that is the model that we have uh, regarding uh, the indian and south indian kind of uh, uh, resistance to cultural nationalism and cultural hegemony so we will look more uh, into the more details perhaps in the second part of the uh, uh, talk